Yes, it does. Yeah. And what's nice as well is that it's, it's all very well. I mean, don't be wrong, there have been times where someone's wanted a, a track and I've been helping a mate out and they can't afford to go to mastering. So I will sort of do a home mastering job. But the other thing as well, they're objective to it. That's why when I get a track to mix I haven't recorded, I can be far more objective than on a mix that I've track I've recorded. Because if you've recorded it, when you turn the guitar up, the one that took seven hours to record because the guy couldn't play it or because the studio broke down or the tape machine broke or the Pro Tools crashed, all that history is kind of there and it sort of clouds it. Whereas if you haven't got any of that and you just go, oh yeah, it's great, and you just carry on, you can just flow and, and be creative and forget about all the other stuff. So there's something to be said for that, definitely. And I think that's true of mastering. They've, they're objected to it. They're very, they, always, they work in one room and they know the room inside out, so when, the, when you bring them something, they can tell exactly if it's good, bad, and what, what might be wrong with it if there's any problems. So. Um, well, generally I do sort of pop and rock music, um, <coughs> just commercial pop and rock, but I do, because I grew up doing lots of different styles of recording at a studio, um, I can do other things and, and I, would, I would recommend it. Don't, don't limit your, your options. If you, if you get a chance to, even if it's not your kind of music, you get a chance to work on something, do it because you'll always learn something from it. I mean, in the last, since, I don't know, one was just before, just before Christmas, I did a bunch of tracks with Jamie Cullum, which was very, very jazzy. Um, brush drums, upright bubble bass, real piano, all live, um, and just, just jazz really. Then um, straight after that I worked on a soundtrack for a film which was modern songs but recorded, well it was originally going to be recorded in 1920s style, well, it was recorded in 1920s style but originally they wanted it to sound like a 1920s record but we went and listened to some and they sound really awful and they probably sounded great at the time, but if you were to play that now in a cinema with surround sound and everything, it would just sound awful. So we decided to do it in completely the style, but make it sound a bit more hi-fi. So we did a uh, 15-piece band with clarinets and brass and strings. Strings were afterwards, um, but everything else was all live at once, and then we just wheeled the strings in and did it. I've done some reggae since Christmas. I've done uh, some quite heavy rock. And last week I was doing a pop singer who's a bit Robbie Williams-y type pop. And then the back end of the week, Phantom of the Opera Part 2 for Andrew Lloyd Webber for his new show that's up the West End. So by being diverse, it means you can work in different fields. So to never narrow your options, always try and keep them open, even if, you know, because the other thing as well, music crosses over. So even as a programmer or a producer or a player, there's often times that someone will go, well, actually, we want a bit more hip-hop for this. So rather than, you know, if I'm working with a band and they've got a programmer, rather than try and get them to do something that's out of their comfort zone, I'll say, well, why don't we get in some hip-hop guy to do it or an R&B guy, and then they get someone in. So things do cross. So that's why it's worth knowing lots of varied styles. The role, my role as a producer, well, it varies on whatever project. Sometimes, sometimes as a producer, you get involved with the band and you're going, the, the most I've done would be at the rehearsal stage and you go in to hear them rehearse. You maybe give them some outside advice, some objective advice about maybe the arrangement or the tempo. You know, you might hear the band playing and the song's got a lot of words and it's all a bit difficult to understand, but because they've been playing it for so long and they've written it, it's second nature to them and they don't hear that, but you coming in as an outsider, fresh, you suddenly think, well, actually, I can't understand what they're singing because it's so quick. So you get them to slow it down a bit, or you go, that little bit there is the biggest hook of the song. Why don't you have that again? Or why don't you make that the chorus and you can get involved with arrangements, getting them to play tight. Because obviously, if we're going into, if you're recording a live band, you've got to go into a considerable studio that's going to cost you just to have the size and the space available and the amount of mics. So therefore, if you can do some donkey work in a rehearsal room somewhere where it's cheap and iron it all out so that the band know what they're doing when they go in, it keeps the cost down, keeps the record company happy, saves money for the band. 
then, you know, or it might be a band that don't have a full complement of musicians. You know, it might be a couple of guys, one's a keyboard player, one's a guitarist, they don't have the rhythm section. So they'll go, well, you know, so you help them find the right drummer. And it doesn't mean the best drummer. You know, there's, there's projects I've done recently where if I got the best drummer I knew to do it, he wouldn't quite be right. They've needed somebody a bit more gritty, a bit more kind of, maybe not technically as good, but just with a bit more attitude, a bit younger and sort of uglier, if you like, and, and you get that kind of thing in. And so it, it's about when, when you're producing records, it's, it's the, the musical side of it and the technical side is a certain amount, but you're also dealing with people and record companies. So you have to kind of have a bit of a business hat to make sure that you're keeping, keeping your eye on the cost and keeping your eye on the time because record companies and marketing people and pluggers all work to a budget and a time scale and in some of those departments especially the marketing the other thing the the actual quality of the mix is secondary it's all about the timing of it they have to have it so many weeks before release because they've got to get it to so and so and so and so and you have to deliver on time otherwise it, it could sort of um, it could hinder that then you're dealing with the artists which some will be great, some will be awkward, some will be wacky and out there just because that's the way they are and that's why they're so talented. And you've got to be diplomatic because there'll often be things going on within the band and it'll be kicking off and you just sort of, so it's, it's sort of 50% talent, 50% diplomat come business. And that just comes with experience. Um, and then if sometimes you might not even be mixing it yourself, even though I come from an engineering background, there might be times I think, well actually, it's been a long painful process, I'm actually too close to this, I'm going to pick someone else to mix it, so I might, I might pick someone or I might get you know, someone else involved or I might get someone in to mix it with me and do it like that. Um, and, and it's hard because you have to be, you're, you're working with, a, with a, another bunch of people that you, you've built up a certain friendship and relationship with. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with you, so you have to kind of be brutally honest. So if they're doing something that's not very good, as much as they're your, your new mates and you're all getting on great, you have to be able to turn and go, well, actually, it's not very good. And there's obviously different ways of putting that. You can put it a certain way and they'll probably start a fight. Or you can be very diplomatic and just explain, and hopefully they'll, you'll have built up some trust and they, they think, actually, yeah, he kind of knows what he's talking about. Maybe he's right. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they, there's no talking to people you know I had a guy the other week I was working with somebody and um, he would programmed his track and he would put um, easy drummer it's like a drummer plug-in it's quite good it's got decent sounds he used all the patterns and we demoed it like that and the idea was we were gonna get in a real drummer to redo the whole thing so we went into Livingston Studios in Wood Green they've got a great drum room we got a really good drum sound got a great drummer redid all the drums on the whole album he was there when we did it, the artist, and I'm mixing away, and he, and he looked really worried, and I said, and, and the track was sounding brilliant, because he had the demo, and we'd replaced all the guitars, we'd replaced the drums, it was just sounding chalk and cheese. And he goes, it's not nearly as good as the demo. And we all went, what? Oh. And he goes, it's just not, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that fill is different. And the reason he couldn't get his head around that he'd played a different fill to the machine. And that was the only thing that made it not as good. So, so we, I finally, after I panicked, like, oh my God, what, what are we doing wrong? I got it out of him what it was. And I said, okay. And he went, but it's no problem. We'll just use the machine for that. And I said, we can't do that. I said, because it sounds completely different. He goes, but I want that feel. And we had like a two hour discussion with everybody trying to explain to him why you can't do that. But why can't I do that? I want that feel. And he went, yeah, but he didn't play it. So we just used that one. And he, and he, he didn't comprehend that it, it just sounded like changing from one track to another track and then back again.